Thank you very much uh, for that warm welcome. Um, as I said, my name is uh, John Moriarty, and I'd like to start by uh, acknowledging uh, the contribution to this piece of work of my co-authors, Dermot O'Reilly, David Wright, uh, and Alan Thurston, um, all of whom had to send apologies for today, but um, uh, all of whom are, are with me here in spirit. And uh, thank you very much uh, to everybody who's been able to make the, the, um, the trip here today um, on this uh, crisp, Winter's afternoon. I don't envy anyone who has to knock on any doorsteps uh, on any doors this evening or any other evening in the coming weeks. Um, but however, this uh, piece of work that I'm presenting is based on a program of work which is part of um, a new centre, a major investment being made uh, at Queen's University in uh, social research and social science research. Uh, that is the Centre for Evidence and Social Innovation. Um, the acronym is SESI, and you can follow us if you're, if you're tweeting along at, uh, at SESI underscore QUB, um, and you can follow me at John M underscore QUB. Um, and speaking of, uh, so the investment um, includes a large focus on educational attainment and its outworkings and the, the role and importance uh, of educational attainment for the, for the wider economy. And speaking about major investments, uh, the Economic and Social Research Council has made a very major investment in uh, the data infrastructure uh, that we have here in Northern Ireland and across the United Kingdom. And this work uh, formed a part of the work of the Administrative Data Research Centre for, for, for Northern Ireland, um, really in trying to make the case for better data linkage around education, better understanding of uh, who, who, who is attaining um, qual uh, good educational uh, grades and, uh, and, and, and levels. Um, by, by demonstrating the, the effect that that has uh, on individuals uh, across their life course. Um, so part of the purpose today uh, is really to demonstrate the capacity of linked administrative data, in this case using data from the Northern Ireland Longitudinal st Study to add insight uh, to areas which would be uh, of, of, of specific interest uh, to many of you here in the audience. And by all means take this presentation to be a starting point and by all means, um, look at ways that your own organizations can get involved in carrying out and contributing to uh, this analysis and using these resources that are being uh, excellently, um, excellently maintained and run um, by, uh, by, 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 by NISRA, um, who are moving to a new Swish building, which will be very hospitable to analysts of any stripe um, in the coming years. And I want to acknowledge uh, the great contribution that, uh, that NISRA and the various funders have made to this data resource. So where are we, or where were we, when last we took a national census in 2011 in terms of occupational class and how we classify the, the various occupations that people report on a census form? Well, this is how class is distributed when we use a three-class version um, and we look at the world based on the 2011 census, and we use the schema that is widely used for socioeconomic classification, which was once known as the Nuffield classification, um, and then became the NSSEC, the socioeconomic classification, which replaced in the 2001 census what was previously used, this Registrar General Socioeconomic Grade. And uh, this is based on the entire uh, set of census returns rounded up, um, for the entire working population, a um, million or so between age 16 and 74 in, in, Northern in, in Northern Ireland in 2011. And all the numbers you'll see in my graphs are, are, are percentages. Um, this three class sort of upper, middle, lower schema can be subdivided then into uh, an, eight, class, an eight, eight group classification um, where we, you can observe, for example, that the that the, uh, that the highest classification, the majority of the top class, is located in uh, what are called lower professional um, occupations or managerial occupations, um, and that a small, further small minority are, are in, uh, in, in, in a top group of an, of an eight class schema, or high, higher professionals or, or upper managers. So having established that sort of global picture, what we want to know is where did these people start out in life or is it if it's true that there isn't much social mobility uh, in our society anymore well is this what we're seeing in 2011 just a replication of what we would have seen in, in previous censuses and structures that were already uh, in existence 
Um, and to find out where people come from, we really need to be able to link up uh, census returns from multiple, uh, from multiple sources. And uh, the main way in which we can do that in the Northern Ireland context is using the Northern Ireland Longitudinal Study, which is a, uh, a representative uh, study of uh, where approximately 28% of the population um, are linked using uh, information on the health card registration. Um, and uh, really, the, all the censuses from 1981 forward can now be, can now be linked uh, to people with, who have uh, 100 or so anonymous uh, birthdays uh, that fall in the calendar. So statistically, one in four of us here in the room approximately are, are part of the Northern Ireland Longitudinal Study and, uh, and our data are being uh, linked in this way and used um, to research areas around health, health inequalities, and also more recently the, uh, the, the broader context, social context um, of, uh, of social mobility and, uh, and, and socioeconomic circumstances. Um, so in order to, 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 to look uh, in depth, we, were, we, we needed to identify a study sub-cohort. So we identified those who were aged 8 to 17 in 1991 um, so that we can look at the sort of social origins, the kind of the, the household level influences on the people who were, um, who, who were in this age range in 1991 and are now, or sorry, and were by 2011 aged 28 to 37. So to be upfront about a limitation um, is that uh, we do lose the outcomes for people who move abroad in the interim period. So, so some people will have emigrated. Um, when we look at the 1991 characteristics, there isn't a massive difference noticeable between those who, who emigrated and those who didn't. They're, that's fairly well distributed across the socioeconomic class uh, schema. So in terms of then that subsample and how representative it is, um, well, as you can see, as compared, these, it's a younger group, so we do have a slightly different uh, socioeconomic distribution um, when we compare uh, the 2011 outcomes for, uh, for the sub-cohort to the full population who slightly, slightly over-represented in, um, in, the, in, the in the top group, in the sort of employer-manager professional group, and slightly underrepresented in the routine manual or unemployed. But that might be about probably what we'd expect given sort of educational expansion, other changes uh, across the society. Now, the, as I mentioned, the NSSCC wasn't in use. The same schema wasn't in use for the 1991 census. So in order to get a picture of 1991, we've had to use a, a coding framework that was developed um, by, uh, by, by the ONS, the Office for National Statistics, um, which enables a, an an approximation of, uh, of, 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 of how the census responses in 1991 would have been tallied up um, if, if, that, if this schema that we now use was being used then. It's highly comparable when we look at a three-class distribution. It's a little less easy to compare when we use an eight-class. So in terms of comparing on the left the social origin of the people in the, in, in the cohort that we're looking at, um, and on the right there, sort of social destination. I only use the three-class schema because it's just because it's easier to compare uh, visually. Um, uh, and as we see, there has been a bit of an expansion um, at, the, uh, at the top, a bit of an expansion at the bottom, and a contraction and the sort of intermediate uh, career categories uh, in the middle. Um, so we know that there's, there's, there's economic change afoot, um, and we know that there's... Um, we, we know that some people have, will, have, will have moved up or down. So let's see uh, to what extent uh, th those people are influenced by their, by their socioeconomic origins. So, um, so comparing the full cohort, I'll just do this one bar at a time just so you can sort of compare it visually yourself. So this is comparing the people comparing the full cohort distribution to people who were at socioeconomic origin one, so whose parents were in that employer, manager, hire pro, or whose head of household actually in the 1991 census was in that. Um, and you'll see all these bars look a little bit different. They start to shrink at the top and expand somewhat at the bottom. So what's of particular interest when we compare this top half of uh, socioeconomic origins? Well, we see a lot more, uh, obviously, we see a lot more people from 
the top two categories uh, attaining these uh, hi higher status occupations. But even there's a significant differential between people whose head of the household were at that uh, elite employer manager level and those who were one tier down um, at, the, at, origin, at origin level two. They're about 50% uh, more likely from, uh, from those from origin two to, to attain that top uh, category. Notably, there's not li fairly little gradation between, uh, between origin three and origin four, um, just a few percentages here and there. Uh, and overall, unemployment is much lower um, for those whose heads of household uh, were in the origin two or the ar origin one, two, or three, and it starts to swell a little bit then when you get to origin four. So how about the people whose uh, parents were at the, uh, at the bottom end of, end of the di distribution again? I'll just go through it one bar at a time so you can sort of get a visual sense of is there much changing really between origin five, origin six, and origin seven? I would probably say not a, not a, not a huge amount. Slight contraction at the top, slight expansion at the bottom, and then you get to origin eight. The people who were from uh, households where there was unemployment in the, in, in, in the first instance. And the outstanding result, I would say, from this study as a whole is that those who he whose heads of household were unemployed in 1991 have approximately twice the rate of employment compared to the full population. Um, those in employment are much more likely to, uh, sorry, th those um, from the unemployed origin uh, who, are un who are in employment by 2011 are also much more likely to have attained sort of lower status uh, supervisory semi-routine or routine uh, employment. So uh, that, that's, a, that, that's a significant sort of um, uh, d disadvantage uh, accruing from having been at an unemployed uh, origin. And we also see, um, yeah, we, we, we also see a little bit of variation between uh, the different origins in terms of relative stability in terms of getting into the, the middle class, but um, uh, a, 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 little, a, little bit of, a, a little bit of up and down between different origins. And we might start to understand that a little bit better when we look at the picture in terms of another key variable that people want to know about, which is gender. So when we compare men and women in the cohort, there's some evidence of, uh, I suppose, the, uh, the glass ceiling effect uh, in terms of there's uh, some evidence of the that 10% of females are in that elite employer manager category versus 13% uh, of males, um, while they are females are actually overrepresented in the group immediately below that in the the lower ma the lower manage managerial group. Um, so overall, and then if you look further down the distribution, um, you see differential. So you see the intermediate is overrepresented with female. Um, while the uh, semi-routine is overrepresent, sorry, is is also overrepresented by female. So, what overall, what you're seeing are differential patterns of employment uh, by gender. Um, but n but while but gender doesn't aggregate to actually being a major uh, predictor of um, of eventual uh, socioeconomic uh, of socioeconomic destination. What is a major predictor, and this will come as no surprise, is education. So looking at the people who uh, in 2011 reported having no academic qualifications, um, there's only a s tiny sliver who are in the higher professional uh, grade and uh, the majority are in that lowest uh, grade in the three class version. Um, the majority are either lower supervisory, semi-routine, routine or unemployed. Um, compare this bit like flipping upside down an hourglass when you look at those who have degrees or uh, third level qualifications. Sorry, there's a mistake just at the top of the bar that says uh, no qualifications. But uh, as you can see, you know, degree holders mass are massively overrepresented in, the, uh, in, in, in those top groupings. So when we, when we take the whole distribution, you actually see a much, if you can picture the line kind of um, coming, being, being drawn through the, the pink and grey, uh, a much steeper line by academic qualification than we saw by, uh, by class origin itself. Um, so there are serious rewards to having a degree 
uh, treble even A-level students' chance at a higher uh, professional um, occupa occupational grade, and time and a half the chance uh, of other professionals. Um, degree holders, it would seem, may have been protected somewhat, those that have stayed in Northern Ireland from the post-2008 um, unemployment uh, issues, where there's, there's less, much less unemployment uh, in these groupings than in uh, those with lower or no educational uh, attainment. So at the other end of the spectrum, there's class penalties for having no qualifications. Um, and from this high level, we don't, we, we don't really know what, exactly what these signify, right? So we, don't, we, we, we can't drill any further using census data as to what's a degree, what's a first degree, what's a third class honours degree, what's a degree in engineering, what's a degree in... Uh, in, 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 in arts or uh, in, another, in, in another area. So this is, this is part of the rationale for getting more data on educa educational attainment and getting a more granular picture of these overall returns to education uh, and to third level education may be represented by a subset of that group who are, um, who, who are particularly thriving. And, and uh, as to the mechanisms in terms of um, intelligence, um, you know, school structures that may help along the way. We, we're really not able to dig right into that until we, uh, until, until we look uh, at a more granular level at what is the educational story behind, uh, uh, behind these differentials. Um, so a final variable to look at is, um, is community background. So here I'll just take a step back for a second before doing the comparisons just to look at what the picture was in terms of... Um, inequality by community background in 1991. Um, unemployment was a greater issue uh, for Catholics and for Protestants, and Protestants uh, were slightly more likely to attain higher, higher status careers. That's uh, in, in no way a new, a new finding. Um, by 2011, and again, this isn't entirely new, um, we see almost in this cohort of uh, people aged 28 to 37 responding to the 2011 census almost exact parity, almost exact parity in terms of, uh, in terms of the broader class stru structure. And then when we break it down into the A class SEMA, we see very, very slight, almost non-significant residual advantages, um, particularly in terms of the bottom of the distribution in terms of ability to avoid unemployment um, for, for Protestants. But overall, for this change to have happened between 1991 and 2011, by necessity, Catholics must have experienced some sort of social mobility, some sort of um, upward trajectory uh, when compared with their household origin. Um, so in terms of how we try and explain that, well, the first variable we'd be inclined to look at would be the one that we found to be the strongest predictor um, of, of, of class uh, de destination and attainment and see well, are there any differences in education between um, the two major community backgrounds? Um, and for all of the previous analysis, I've excluded people who reported uh, no religion or reported uh, a religion that couldn't be classified as, as Catholic or Protestant. So this is a slight, somewhat of a sub subsample of a subsample, but it's, uh, it's at about 95% it's at about of that subsample. Um, so as you can see, where, where differentials where we see them is actually Catholics are slightly more likely still to have no qualifications, but those that go through education are uh, much less likely to drop out at the early qualification level um, on the Catholic side at the GCSE attainment level, and then they return to more or less parity in terms of, and most people don't drop out at A-level, most people once they've, made, once they've attained A-levels go on and... Uh, 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 go on and attend university, um, and that becomes their highest highest qualification. So there is something to the educational narrative behind uh, shifts in, 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 in community representation in, in, in employment. Um, but it, yeah, it, it's 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 pr probably um, uh, pr probably at a different stage in the trajectory than 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 we might have expected. So by way of conclusion. There is evidence for some uh, intergenerational mobility uh, among middle classes. Um, uh, along the class spectrum, it's only at certain points where we see real advantage and real disadvantage uh, accruing. But there's also persistent cyclical effects from both affluence and from unemployment. 
Academic attainment seems to be the strongest predictor of occupational attainment, but we need to know more in order to know what, what, what drives that, what drives that major dis differential. Um, social mobility for Catholics seems to have diluted some of the previous inequalities between uh, community backgrounds for this cohort, and some of that is likely explained uh, by some Protestants leaving education earlier. And the policy challenges include and I've written this in the policy paper uh, at, at a little greater length than I can go into here, but probably, probably some, uh, so, some of the challenges include recognition and reward for non-academic alternatives to academic education, uh, such as in-work training. Um, and how, so how can, we, how can we reward those who continue to learn past the conventional academic uh, track and continue to upscale? Um, and... Uh, Absolutely, further data linkage, for example, in educational attainment will allow for deeper analysis of uh, the points at which these, uh, these inequalities take effect and what is underlying them. Uh, so I want to say thank you very much for your attention. Um, the next speaker was actually my PhD supervisor, so he's, uh, you know, it's not inappropriate that I'll be his opening act for uh, this afternoon, but uh, I'm sure we'll get a lot more insight now on zero hours contracts. Thank you.